Good morning, and welcome to my review of Dalek, the sixth episode of the Doctor Who revival. Not to be confused with the Daleks, the power of the Daleks, the evil of the Daleks, day of the Daleks, planet of the Daleks, death to the Daleks, genesis of the Daleks, destiny of the Daleks, resurrection of the Daleks, revelation of the Daleks, remembrance of the Daleks, but just simply... Dalek. I can kind of excuse the use of Autons in the opening episode, Rose, as it is aimed to attract new audiences and the old. After four episodes of relatively new ideas, the series decided to diverge a little into a nostalgia fest of a story based around Doctor Who's number one enemy, the Daleks. So, was it worthwhile in my opinion? Well, you're just going to have to wait until the end of the review to find out, but for now, let's extract this episode's succulent nutrients and see if this story holds up compared to the cultural status of its antagonist that came over 40 years before this episode's production. <laughs> Good. Can you say it fast? <laughs> As much as I appreciate the blending of fictional and documented alien encounters, it soon becomes apparent upon our protagonist's arrival that the museum is basically catered to any hardcores that have been watching the show since the 60s. We see a Slitheen stuffed arm and a Cyberman head, which are both remains of times gone by for the Doctor. It would have been interesting to see something like a gas mask from the future of this series locked up in the museum too that the Doctor doesn't recognise, and I understand this opening doesn't last more than two minutes, so it's not that big of a deal, but an improvement that I think would have piqued an audience's interest nonetheless. Speaking from somebody who lived through the American election of 2012, it's interesting looking back on this episode where Diana Goddard correctly predicted the Democratic win for that year, especially as the Republicans were on their way out three years after this episode aired. This small scene in the corridor with Van Staten, Adam and Diana is very compact. All the mixing of fast footsteps and quickfire conversations delivers almost everything we need to know about the three characters in seconds. Adam's the errand boy, Diana becomes the metaphor secretary, and Henry is the leader of the base who has little to no time to deal with things that irritate him, but plenty for those that interest him, such as the Dalek. He will barely look at the individuals he's not interested in, but as soon as Diana comes along, something pretty and pleasing to look at, he stops the march to give her some conversation. This kind of attitude comes round again once he's bored of the alien instrument the Doctor has just instructed him to use with delicate precision. I would like to have known a bit more about Van Staten, aside from the fact that he's basically running the government from his underground base and has enough money to buy every alien artifact on Earth. Don't get me wrong, I love this character being this whiny child who, when he can't get what he wants, freaks out when he's not in control and treats elements of beauty with total disregard when they no longer entertain him. But I think it would be interesting to know a little bit more about how he came to be this entrepreneurial, internet-owning, alien-obsessive nutcase. Going back to my point about catering to fans of the old, I think this episode would have benefited from not giving away the antagonist so early on. Granted, when I was a kid I couldn't give a fuck and all these aliens that I'd never seen in my life were being brought back onto TV so it would have been all new to me. But looking at it now I think if the next time trailer at the end of World War 3 or even the title of the episode for that matter hadn't included any mention of images or Daleks the story could have been more enticing. There's no need to nickname the Dalek a Metaltron when everybody already knows what's inside the cage. This is why I find the reveal of the Dalek rather anticlimactic considering its cultural significance. However, the dynamic layout of the episode is very much commendable once this reveal has been made. For the first time, fans of the original series do correct me if I'm wrong, we see the Daleks not as the strongest and most dangerous species in the universe, but instead pitiful and in chains. This scene with the Doctor and the Dalek bickering and taunting each other allows us to confront the Doctor's morality in this episode. It's briefly mentioned before about this whole time war business, but now we can see the Doctor's true colours, the murderer of the Dalek race as well as the Time Lords, allowing him to confront his own choices. This is demonstrated beautifully through Eccleston's fantastic performance as he stampedes around the chained Dalek taunting and almost interrogating, yet he could be considered the one in the wrong here. This is further emphasised by the use of POV shots from the Daleks' perspective. Again, I don't know if this was used in the original series, but this use of perspective allows us literally to see both points of view, from that of morality and the opposing argument. At this point in the episode, he is blinded by his anger and tortures the Dalek. I'll return to the Doctor's righteousness later on, but how the fuck did he know that that precise lever would torture the Dalek? 
and I thought that thing the American was forcing inside the Dalek was torturing it too. We encounter a rather cringy conversation between Adam and Rose. I honestly think that Adam was the worst thing to come out of the first series, and it's unfortunate that he was put into this episode considering it's relatively decent. His performance is irritating, Rose is playing around with some shit on the wall for some reason, and it just feels like the episode is forcing some form of romance that just isn't there with the music. His purpose feels a lot more fitting in the following episode, The Long Game, but at the same time I can't understand why this scene even exists. It feels so out of place considering the rest of what's already been built up up until this point. Just last year, my scientists cultivated bacteria from the Russian crater and do you know what we found? The cure for the common cold. Um, actually that's not true considering we still have the common cold in 2016 so, uh, you're factually incorrect, me! Brian, I've told you that you're to only show up from time to time in my Harry Potter videos, can you please just fuck off? Um, no, unfortunately the asylum wouldn't have me back as they claimed I was a threat to both the staff and the other patients. Well, I guess you can live with me then. Why would I want to live with somebody who hasn't watched all the original Doctor Who episodes since 1963 and hasn't even read all the Harry Potter books yet? The series finished in 2007, Harry! 2007! You're preventing me from doing my review now, mate, so I'll just deal with you when I get round to Goblet of Fire, alright? Fine! Right, okay, apologies. Where was I? Oh yeah, Chris Eccleston, topless and tortured. Mm. I really like this scene, not only because it establishes Van Staten's lack of insight into how dangerous the Dalek is, but also that the Doctor is being treated like he's another one of his exhibits. Even though he takes a human form and speaks English, Henry takes him down to be tortured anyway, the good old fashioned American way. <laughs> a very small aspect that I like in this scene here is that Adam still needs to show his clearance code to see the Dalek, showing he was probably a replacement for somebody just like him prior to the episode events. He may not have even been there that long, adding more detail to his character. The music and vocal performance of Nicholas Briggs in this segment that follows is absolutely fantastic. It allows us to sympathise with the Dalek for perhaps the first time ever. Now that it's weak and fragile, through Rose we can see a glimpse at how this creature has more to it than what its reputation holds. For some reason though, a time traveller touching a Dalek allows it to regenerate its ability to be the killing machine it once was and goes on a rampage. <laughs> can't get out. That lock's got a billion combinations. The Dalek's a genius. It can calculate a thousand billion combinations in one second flat. Yeah, and it took 11 dramatic seconds to calculate 100 million combinations, 1,000 times slower than you predicted. For some bizarre reason too, the power of the internet revives the Dalek to full power, and we have this really fantastic CGI rendition of bullets being completely disintegrated by the Dalek's shield. The music in slow motion really works in its favour of showing how much of a brutal powerhouse this Dalek has become. What's even more interesting is how the scene shows the creature's lack of identification with the other characters. It doesn't see human beings, it sees obstacles to destroy. The Dalek's laser completely removes any form of recognition from the character. All we see are bones with a light beam around everything else, and as the scene progresses we see more close-ups than mid-shots until we just simply see the Dalek firing until there are no people left. Then we have a beautifully placed shot of Van Staten just looking up in silence, realising that he sent those men in to die. For a brief glimpse, Van Staten's empathy towards human beings comes out and it's shown fantastically through the pacing coming to a complete halt and the still empty shot of him just gawping with disbelief. A fantastic segment for showing off how powerful the Daleks are in this new era of Doctor Who. Another fantastic segment that excellently shows the new incarnation of the Dalek comes along when it elevates up the stairs. This part shows the absolute futility of negotiating with a Dalek as they scream at it telling it the killing needs to stop and doesn't respond at all, only with death when it reaches the officer. Aim for the dome, the head, the eyepiece. That's the weak spot. Thank you, Doctor, but I think I know how to fight one single tin robot. <laughs> We 
We now come to quite possibly my favourite scene of the episode. The Dalek patiently bides its time to make sure it's got plenty of attention before getting soldiers soaking wet and then eliminating them in just two quick blasts. This now establishes strategy and intelligence within the Dalek's head as opposed to just pure indirect power. This then comes into play further when it addresses the Doctor immediately after slaughtering the armed men. I cannot commend Eccleston's performance enough in this segment. It's just pure resentment and impatience boiling up to this moment. The Daleks have failed! Why don't you finish the job and make the Daleks extinct? Rid the universe of your filth! Why don't you just die?! You'd think this would be enough for the Daleks to go on, but it has to have the spiteful last words. You would make a good Dalek. This is where the Doctor has to confront this dilemma, but refuses to. He cannot bear the thought of losing the moral high ground, and immediately jumps to the survival priority instead. You can see this thought irritating him as they try to figure a way to sort out the bulkheads, and it's fantastic seeing his rage just building throughout the episode, especially when he goes ballistic about Henry's collection, which makes him look like a spoilt brat being told off by Mummy and Daddy in this segment here. I do like the build-up towards Rose's supposed death, though, the dialogue, performances and pacing works really well in making first time viewers assume just for a moment that she's died at the hands of the Dalek. As they are travelling up the elevator, I really like how the Dalek begins to question its own morality too, instead of ignoring it like the Doctor, which is very interesting hearing a Dalek being confused and distressed like this. Some may argue that this makes it too human, but at the same time I would say that it behaves in this fluctuating way because it simply doesn't understand its function anymore. It doesn't obey anybody anymore, the Daleks aren't feeding it instructions or anything, so it becomes obsessed with what's right, wrong, questioning its decisions and even its own existence. Really interesting stuff. This is partially due to our lack of understanding in regards to this Dalek's prior history. What did it do aside from fighting the Time War? Did it have any individual free reign whatsoever in any part of its life? I highly doubt it. This questioning of consciousness and desire for freedom can be seen in a creature that never truly had it. It was always told what to do and how to do it. Now it's simply free from the binds of its superiors and can do what it wants. The brilliant pacing and music drives the emotion home when it begins to open itself and sees the sunlight with its own eyes, not through the blue lens of the machine. I really love this handcrafted Dalek squid thing that lies within. It's gross and unearthly, but at the same time it's pitiful and weak, allowing the music to make us feel sympathetic for it. The Doctor interrupts this beautiful moment with an intelligently crafted segment where the Doctor stands there, ready to kill the Dalek. This shot alone describes just how pathetic he looks. This big machine in his arms that not only looks out of place, but is so uncharacteristic that Rose just has to show him that this is not the right way of going about a problem. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind is written all over her face. The dialogue and performances of the three leading up to the Dalek's death is fantastic. Eccleston's realisation of the monster he's become, Rose's protective stance over the Dalek and the painful slow delivery of the Dalek's lines, all bringing a beautifully dramatic closure to the episode. I really have to commend Robert Shearman's script here. It truly is a role coaster of emotions from start to finish, from irritation to pain, excitement and fear to revelation and depression, all in the space of a standalone 45 minute episode that brought back the most renowned bad guy of the series. If I hadn't known that Adam would serve his purpose in the next episode, I would have been very irritated that he came along considering how useless he was, but I guess I'll let him off for now. So, did it suck? I give Dalek an 8 out of 10 as it is a great story containing fantastic characters and delves very deeply into questions of morality. The opening moments are comparatively weaker, especially Rose and Adam's scene, but once that's out of the way, the story bursts into life, where some excellent performances, design and camera work comes into play to deliver a brilliantly crafted ending. I just wish Robert Shearman could have written more stuff like this for TV. It's a shame he never really did anything else for Doctor Who. Before we get to some outtakes, I thought I'd give a shout out to Film Explained who's just started out here on YouTube. He has an absolutely hilarious and in-depth seven part review of Doctor Who and why it's no longer worth watching. If you really like Star Trek and X-Files as well, go over there and subscribe to him because his content's just superb. My nose is blocked to fucking shit. Oh, that's really annoying and disgusting. I'm gonna put some snuffy up my nose. AKA cocaine. <laughs>
<coughs> Woo, baby. I'll return to the doctor's righteousness. Uh, righteousness. Ugh. Then we have a beautifully placed shot. Then we have a. <laughs> oh god, the critic. I have the biggest fucking oh, pins and needles. <laughs> it doesn't. They're not telling him to kill anything for fuck's sake. You'd think this would be enough for the Dalek to go on, but it has. <laughs> I really love this handcrafted Dalek squid thing that lies within. It's cr- Oh dear. <laughs>